This event is brought to you by the Alliance Program, Columbia Global Centers um, Paris, uh, the US Sciences Po Foundation, the Columbia Maison Francaise, and the European Institute. Many of you watched the debate or part of the debate yesterday that opposed Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen. This is a momentous time in French history. The stakes are very high and the consequences of this election could be wide ranging for France, of course, but also for Europe and for the rest of the world. To analyze where we stand today and what to expect in the coming days, we brought together a high powered panel of speakers who will help cast light on the current political landscape. The discussion will be moderated by Alexis Buisson. Alexis is the US correspondent of the French daily newspaper La Croix. He also works for several other French speaking publications, Le Point, Télérama, Mediapart, La Tribune de Genève. From 2011 to 2019, he was the managing editor of French Morning. Many of you are familiar with this publication. He wrote um, a guide to moving to New York, s'installer à New York, and is the author of an upcoming biography in French of Vice President Kamala Harris. Alexis is a graduate of Sciences Po and has been living in New York since 2007. Alexis, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Bonjour à tous. Thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to moderate this debate. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And obviously, I think we can all agree it's been a strange uh, campaign. Uh, campaigning started late. It was overshadowed by the war in Ukraine. But here we are. Uh, there is three days to go until uh, the second round of the French presidential elections. So the, the faces are familiar. They're the same faces as in 2017. Emmanuel Macron on the one side, the incumbent president, and Marine Le Pen, uh, the far right candidate from Le Rassemblement National. Faces are the same, but obviously the country is not the same. Uh, there's only there's a war now, uh, as we know, only a few hours away from Paris. There was the COVID crisis. And Emmanuel Macron is not a new candidate anymore. He has a record uh, to defend now. And that's what we're going to speak about with um, the three panelists that will be uh, joining me uh, today. Where things stand uh, today, what uh, does this election say about the current state of the electorate, um, of the French electorate? And uh, as the campaign really enters its final days, I just wanted to uh, show you the results of the first round of the election, uh, just to remind everybody where things uh, stand. So um, obviously, Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen arrived first, 27% of the vote for Macron, 23.1% for uh, Marine Le Pen. Um, the third position goes to Jean-Luc Mélenchon, 21.9%, almost 22%. He's considered the far left candidate in uh, this race. 7% for Eric Zemmour, who was coined uh, the, the, mini, the French Trump or the French mini Trump. Um, and then we enter uh, the group of candidates that are under 5%. As you might know, the 5% threshold is very important in French politics because under that threshold, uh, campaign expenses are not reimbursed. Uh, and of course, the group, that group of candidates is pretty interesting. Um, Yves Jadot, the green candidate, is at 4%, uh, just behind Valérie Pécresse. Uh, she, uh, like Annie Hidalgo, uh, was one of the representative traditional parties, uh, Valérie Pécresse being the candidate of Les Républicains, and uh, Annie Hidalgo, who is um, above 1%, uh, was uh, the representative of the uh, Socialist Party. Um, obviously, uh, these uh, scores are a huge blow for those uh, traditional parties that have uh, dominated uh, the French political landscape for uh, decades. And uh, obviously, we'll be uh, speaking about uh, those uh, scores in, um, in this panel. So um, without further ado, uh, I'm happy to welcome our panelists, um, Florence Egel. Bonjour, Florence. Uh, she is a professor of political science at uh, Sciences Po. She is the head of the Center for European Studies and uh, Comparative Politics. Her research focuses on political parties and more uh, specifically on uh, the transformation of the French uh, right, uh, which was in fact um, the subject of one of your books, uh, Florence, Les Droites en Fusion, which came out in 2012. Um, merci d'être là. Isabelle Guinaudot, 
is a CNRS political scientist at the Centre Emile Durkheim at uh, Sciences Po Bordeaux. Uh, her work is about electoral studies, public opinion, and uh, public policy. She's involved in several uh, collaborative research projects uh, focused on political platforms or agenda. Um, she was uh, the principal investigator of Parti Pol, of the Parti Pol study, uh, which is a large uh, project on uh, partisanship in policy making. And uh, last but not least, Vincent Tiberi, Hi. is a university professor and researcher at Sciences Po Bordeaux. Uh, he is a specialist uh, in uh, of electoral sociology, political psychology, and he has worked on voter behavior in France, Europe, and the United States. And of course, uh, Vincent, your expertise on the youth uh, vote uh, will be, I'm sure, pretty uh, pretty interesting uh, in in this panel. Um, before we dive into the questions, uh, one last uh, one last uh, uh, thing to say uh, that if you want to ask uh, your questions to uh, our panelists, feel free to uh, leave us a short question in the Q and A uh, box uh, on uh, Zoom, um, and I will uh, make sure to get to those in the second half of uh, the the panel. Um, Thank you to all three of you. First question, I guess, is the question that uh, I think is in everybody's minds here on the side of the Atlantic. Um, what is the likelihood uh, that France uh, will have a President Le Pen on Sunday? Um, who wants to start, Vincent? Okay, uh, likelihood very low, actually. Uh, it would happen only if uh, people don't show up in the poll. Uh, only if you have a bad uh, report from the left to Emmanuel Macron, from the moderate right to Emmanuel Macron, and a, a strong rise and a strong mobilization in favor of Marine Le Pen. So very low uh, likelihood, but uh, you never know. Uh, same thing as Brexit or uh, the election of Trump. It could happen, and it has not been. Uh, it, 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 it is even uh, it, uh, the likelihood is even bigger than uh, five years ago or. Uh, let's say 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Florence? Well, it, it's a first really tricky question <laughs> because as you know, we, we must be very careful when it comes to electoral forecasting. Uh, and I think I, I, I will not take the risk uh, on, on this matter, but I think that uh, we know that polls give Emmanuel Macron uh, uh, winning with a relatively comfortable lead, uh, less than uh, 2017, but still with a score around the 55 of the votes. So it's a quite good margin. But we know, and the precedents the president of Brexit and uh, of the election of Donald Trump, uh, we know that we are in mind that uh, surprise can occur. So we are all, always very careful. But I think that the, the, the yesterday, the, the, the TV debate mm -hmm. did change uh, uh, the thing. And I think it, it will not impact uh, the results because it was quite balanced. And we cannot say that one is a winner and the other was a loser. So I think uh, we were waiting for this debate to know if something, uh, an accident could happen. But it, it didn't. Sure, and and in uh, the pure tra uh, French uh, tradition, there will there will only be one uh, televised debate between between the candidates before before the second round. Uh, Isabel, yeah, of course, predicting is a is a risky business these days. But uh, what is your what is, uh, is your feeling about the likelihood uh, of a Le Pen victory on Sunday? Uh, like my colleagues, I would not dare to make uh, any firm predictions. I mean, in some cases, it's easier. For that election, we have already seen at the first round uh, that the polls did provide a picture. But uh, if we look at Mélenchon's score, for instance, that there can be surprises. And I don't think that it's, um, it's due to the polls doing a bad job, but a lot of people make up their mind in the last, um, in the last moment. Um, and we, we, we did know that among the left, uh, left-wing voters, uh, there was a lot of incertitude. And again, we see that among, especially among um, Mélenchon's voters, there are a lot who are still uncertain what they will do. Mm. Uh, around the first round, we had a very short lead. The polls have been consistently predicting a lead by Macron. So I would agree that this is the most likely uh, scenario. 
but the lead um, has been very short around the first round and uh, the margins of errors have been <laughs> overlapping. So there was an unlikely but still possible scenario. And like uh, Vincent said, I would say at, at the first round, I would have said it depends on what happens between the two rounds. Um, I would agree that the TV debate will not change, um, will not change much um, the, the outcome. Um, and yes, and um, it will also depend on the on the on the ability of Macron to move the left left wing uh, voters to oppose uh, the National Front. Mm -hmm. And you were uh, speaking of the Mélenchon voters, uh, and they are uh, obviously divided between uh, not voting uh, or uh, voting Macron or uh, even uh, voting Le Pen in some cases. Yes, we have seen very clearly Zemmour and Dupont-Aignan on the far right calling to call for yeah. uh, to vote for Le Pen. Um, we have seen left-wing candidates calling to vote uh, for Macron and opposing Le Pen. Uh, Mélenchon said not a single vote for Madame Le Pen. Uh -huh. He did not say uh, explicitly, uh, he did not call to vote for Macron. And according to the polls, there were, but there are now less, but immediately after the fir first round, there were a significant number of uh, Mélenchon's vote, uh, voters who considered to not to not to vote to abstain or even to vote for for Le Pen, um, which can be explained by perhaps less by support uh, for Le Pen, but by the detestation of Macron, who was very unpopular by the end of his mandate. And it seems to be a pretty uh, interesting feature about this election. It seems that the, the candidate who will vote, uh, who will uh, win on Sunday, will probably be the less uh detested if i may say uh candidates of of, of the two uh, um i was curious to uh have uh your opinion on the first round and uh, maybe andrew you can pull up uh the results that i was showing earlier and i was curious to have your opinion um as to whether you were surprised by some of the things that you saw coming out of of the results um of that first round these are not polls these are definite results um, Isabel, maybe you want you want to kick us off. Um, what I was surprised mostly, um, perhaps three three things. Perhaps abstention was not as high as was expected by many observers, even even if it's higher the, than the average. We did not reach the levels of uh, abstention of the two thousand and two election. But what was most surprising, in my view was the score of Valérie Pécresse. Um, we have seen uh, the disastrous score of the Socialist Party already in 2017. This election, we have seen that both traditional mainstream parties who used to be the two parties in the second round have been eliminated and do not even reach the 5% um, threshold. Uh, and this is... Uh, I think one of the big issues of the of the election, uh, how these parties are going to to survive, and uh, and um, of course I was very surprised um, by uh, Mélenchon's score, who uh, that was very very uh, far far above the the predictions in the polls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Florence. Well, I think part of the result of the first round confirmed and amplified the transformation we had seen in 2017. So it was not a, a, a real surprise because we already knew that the, the French party system was organized with a three partition as far as uh, uh, ideological uh, structuration uh, is concerned. So uh, I think it, this is quite important because it's a sort of a, a structuration of, uh, of the party system in the three major blocks. Maybe it's not blocks it's because it's, uh, it's, not, uh, um, it's not really uh, institutionalized. It's, uh, it's more vague than, <laughs> than a block, but we have uh, three major polls. One is, of course, uh, Marine Le Pen uh, uh, voters, and we knew that. It's not new because it's an old story in France. Uh, and, and since 2002, we know that it is a very strong 
pole for, 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 for the, the, the political landscape. And we have a, a, a new one since 2017. It was what we can call a liberal cosmopolitan poll with Macron. Or we can have other words. Some of our colleagues have other words, but it's, it's the, 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 the liberal in terms of economy, in terms of politics, in terms maybe of cultural things, but it's also very pro European. And we have now a new one, a new one. It's not a, it's, an, it's a new left, maybe, because it is a, a, a Paul Van Paul uh, uh, represented by uh, Mélenchon, who is uh, uh, an eco socialist, as uh, some colleagues said, Paul. And it's really uh, the, the, the success of Mélenchon to, 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 to put together uh, social issues and new environmental issues. And this is why the candidate, ecological candidate, was so, so weak because all, uh, all, all the voters who were very concerned by the question of uh, 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 environment uh, have uh, already voted for Mélenchon. So we have these three polls, and I think uh, they are not fully established, as I said, but it, it, they, are, they are quite different. And if, you, if we look at their social composition, who we who vote for them, and if we look at, at, at the the territorial location of this electorate, we have three very different things, mm -hmm. and we have a very strong cleavages between a rural uh, location for Marine Le Pen, urban location for Macron and Mélenchon but in a different ways, mm -hmm. suburbs for uh, and popular uh, neighborhood for, for Mélenchon and the uh, center of the city for, for Macron. So we have really a, a, a social structure which distinguish these uh, three poles. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's, it's important. And of course, Isabella said that uh, the, the other big thing of this first round is the collapse of the classical uh, political parties, and especially the collapse of the right-wing party, Les Républicains, mm -hmm. because it was not expected, uh, and, it, um, and it is uh, very, very new, and it is uh, uh, quite important, historical. And I, I was looking at the figures uh, for the first round of uh, the 2017 election, and François Fillon, the candidate of that party, was at 20%. Uh, so it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big drop. Um, Vincent, what are your takeaways of the first round, and uh, what does it say about the electorate today? That's very science po to use this possibility of uh, presenting between change and continuity. Uh, so we are very, uh, very classical here. Uh, first of all, um, um, turnout was uh, finally. Uh, bigger than expected, which is something interesting. This is something interesting because it means that uh, it, it, it was not foreseen because the, the campaign was uh, very short, not uh, well organized. The agenda was not the one defended by the electorate per se. Uh, the main candidate, Emmanuel Macron, decided to run a very, uh, very uh, late during the campaign. He was not actually campaigning until uh, two weeks before the first round. So it could have been, uh, uh, it could have been bigger in terms of, uh, of abstention. It means that uh, the, the French are uh, taking uh, this election seriously, mm -hmm. first of all. Secondly, uh, yes, you could think that something um, is uh, re-happening again. Same faces, more or less the same votes for Macron, for uh, Marine Le Pen, for Mélenchon, with more or less a two or three percent uh, difference between the two, uh, the two elections. Uh, the only change would be uh, the collapse of um, the traditional right. Well, uh, this, is, um, this is more complicated. This is more complicated because when you look at um, the data we can have on uh, voting probabilities, you see that actually uh, most of the French are now experiencing a very negative feelings toward a lot of candidates, including Emmanuel Macron. Uh, when I was looking at uh, data from uh, several uh, pollsters and also from Ellipse, which is uh, 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 an internet panel done here at, uh, at Sciences Po, uh, Emmanuel Macron was uh, voted zero out of 10 
when uh, when people were um, were asked whether or not they, they could vote for him. This is really big, really big. Uh, same thing for uh, Mélenchon, same thing for Pécresse, same thing for Le Pen or Zemmour, which means that uh, um, it has ended up with, uh, with uh, voting for several candidates. But in the same time, you can't think that this is pure support. A lot of, uh, of, of voters are actually voting negatively, even in the first round, which is something new, which means that uh, particularly um, it could be tricky for uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, for instance. He was already first um, among the leftist uh, candidates in 2017, uh, but in the same time, he lost almost half of, the, uh, of his vote uh, one month later in the legislative elections. Uh, in the European election, that was, that was less than 6% of the vote for LFI, which means that uh, you can't think that uh, the French uh, leftist voters are now aligned uh, and strongly aligned uh, towards Jean-Luc Mélenchon and his party. It could be more complicated and more complicated even for the next uh, legislative election. Mm -hmm. uh, it tells also something regarding uh, what happened during, um, during the last days of the campaign. Uh, sure, um, Isabel was saying, okay, people have make up their mind. Yes, okay, but you have also some over systematic overestimation of the left. Nevertheless, you have three vote util who has actually uh, reinforced the three uh, front runners, which is Emmanuel Macron uh, stole some, uh, some of the vote of uh, Valérie Pécresse, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the same thing has happened between Eric Zemmour and Marine Le Pen, and same, same thing has happened between uh, the, the uh, Green voters, the Socialist voters, and uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Nevertheless, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon he ha has been very badly estimated with a really strong margin of error. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, one interesting aspect, I think, uh, is uh, the, the way that uh, the, the, young, the young French people who, in fact, went to vote uh, voted. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, obviously, um, a big chunk of, of that electorate voted for uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, but also quite an important amount uh, of uh, voters under uh, 34 uh, voted for uh, Marine Le Pen. Um, and that's more than... Um, you know, who, those who voted for uh, for Emmanuel Macron. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so uh, Vincent, I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more what, what you think is happening there among uh, young voters and uh, Marine Le Pen exactly. Well, first of all, uh, young voters are not a block. They are very different from each other. Uh, you, have, uh, you have young who are actually suffering very bad situation particularly regarding job precarity, regarding incomes, regarding discrimination. You have also a part of the, of the young voters who are actually very happy with their situation. Uh, and so you, you, you can't treat them as if uh, they were uh, each time uh, happy with each other or agree, agree with each other. Uh, for instance, the one who has actually voted for Emmanuel Macron as the one who are actually uh, living well. They are uh, among the, the middle class. They are doing the good studies. Most of, some of them could be in, in, uh, in Sciences Po, for instance. Uh, and uh, they are happy with uh, the proposition of, uh, of Emmanuel Macron. They are happy with this idea of uh, a liberal economy, with this idea of an, an open society, with the European integration as it is, uh, which could be also different uh, for, for others. Um, what is also interesting is that uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon was able, and uh, usually that's not the same, they do, either they don't vote or they don't vote for the same candidate, but he was able to, able to bring together uh, both the young from the uh, deprived neighborhood, but also the young from the Bobo neighborhood, uh, the, the city centers, uh, very connected with, uh, with the world and uh, very uh, happy with uh, diversity, etc., etc. This, uh, this um, uh, center turn uh, youngsters who are, who are actually fighting for climate, etc. Mm -hmm. So Jean-Luc Mélenchon was able to, uh, to, to bring these people together because he was also able to talk to uh, 
uh, both uh, environmentalist, both uh, social and both the uh, cultural activist, which is something uh, interesting. Last but not least, you have uh, you have the Le Pen voter and the uh, and the abstainers, and uh, both share some social features. They are, they are uh, the, less, um, the less educated in a very educated uh, generations. They are the one who, for most of them, are already uh, on, the, uh, on the work, uh, are already working. And when they are working, they are working with a very uh, low wage uh, salary, with uh, very uh, uh, precarious jobs. And, uh, and they are actually suffering on various, um, on, on, on various points such as cultural identity, such as social identity, um, and uh, probably gender identity too, uh, which means that uh, some of the abstainers could have joined Marine Le Pen uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, what is really um, dangerous for the French democracy is that uh, these abstainers are uh, now also uh, uh, um, uh, does not show in other, in other, uh, in other uh, way of uh, voicing their message. They don't participate in trade unions. They don't participate in demonstrations. They don't participate in protestation. And this uh, this part of uh, a silent generation are actually um, are actually uh, troublesome when you think in terms of social inequalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Florence, do you want to react? Well, I, I agree with, with Vincent, and, and, and uh, I think there are different types of uh, youth, of course, <laughs> and they are really divided. And also, you, you emphasize the fact that uh, abstention was massive among the youngest, uh, reaching very, very uh, uh, high percentage. And I'm sure abstention will be very massive also uh, uh, on Sunday among uh, young people. So it's also an important thing. Well, um, I, I just want to add something uh, about um, Marine Le Pen electorate. That's one of our colleagues, Nona Mayer, uh, studied the, the gender gap among uh, uh, Le Pen electorate. And uh, what is really interesting is to notice that the, there is a narrowing of, of the gender gap in Le Pen Electorat, uh, especially among the youngest age groups. And uh, traditionally, uh, men uh, voted more for Le Pen and women less. And it was very strong when it was the father, when it was Jean-Marie Le Pen. So it, it begins to, to, to change when uh, 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 Marine Le Pen took the, the head of the party because she is a woman and because also she, she emphasized the fact that uh, uh, she was uh, an ordinary woman uh, 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 educating uh, uh, her children alone, divorced, etc., etc. And uh, uh, now what we see is the narrowing of, of the gender gap and uh, uh, among young women employed in uh, some uh, services uh, uh, and I think it's interesting to, to, to notice that, but it, it is also a consequence of uh, the, the de-demonization, what we call uh, de-diabolization, de-demonization of, of, of the far right. And, and the fact that now it's, uh, Marine Le Pen is quite popular, popular among, uh, um, among women and young women. And, uh, uh, this is, I think, an important uh, thing. And also, I think that uh, when we are, we look at, uh, at Le Pen electorat and uh, um, among the young people, we, we have also to, to, get, to keep in mind the fact that it's urban versus rural young people. And you have also the, the, now the, 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 the place of uh, Marine Le Pen in a rural area and uh, young rural people. And I think it is maybe a, a, a little the same in the US uh, that uh, uh, we have the same transformation uh, and the same results also in Europe and in France. Mm -hmm. Isabel, um, uh, specifically the, the youth vote for uh, Marine Le Pen. Um, I know you studied, for instance, the, the platforms, the program. Uh, of the various uh, candidates? 
Yes, um, I agree with what has been said that we have currently several cleavages at play and there is, there is a generation, um, there are different differences between the age cohorts, um, but there are also social cleavages uh, as was already emphasized and urban uh, rural cleavages. And it's very interesting to see how they combine and how they are appealed and activated uh, by campaigning on, on policy. And indeed, we have um, voters for Mélenchon and for Le Pen who are on average poor um, or, uh, than, the, than the voters uh, for Macron who are uh, more rich. Um, and we have uh, differences between age cohorts and senior citizens who tend to vote much more uh, for Macron. Um, and this is also reflected in the manifestos because Macron has very, he has actually very few programs on that election. He has claimed that the times are uncertain, that it's difficult to make promises. And if we look at his uh, manifesto, he does not have much social policy and everything it's con concentrated on the, um, on the senior citizens. Mm -hmm. So he has also appealed uh, a lot to them and he has very few uh, propositions for the youth. And on the contrary, Marine Le Pen has tried to profile herself in terms of a candidate for purchasing power and a social candidate. I think we can debate about the credibility of that image um, because uh, she does not say much about how she is going to found those uh, propositions. Um, and she is also pledging to cut taxes at the same time. So it's really not clear how she's going to found her social policy. And at the same time, she wants to reserve the social policy and including the youth policy to the French. So it's a particular notion of social policy, but still she has promised, for instance, free transport uh, in trains at certain hours for the youth, or she promises to um, not to tax the youth under uh, 30 years and uh, such a thing. So she has tried to appeal to them. Um, and Mélenchon has had, I think, a very promising strategy to appeal the youth because at the same time, he ha also has an electorate that is, that is less uh, rich, but at the same time, they have higher levels of diploma and there are uh, voters interested also in cultural issues such as liberties, post-materialist uh, concerns, etc., cetera, and that tend to be also important to parts of the youth. So he has, at the same time, basic income propositions targeted to the youth, which is new and very, very important. And at the same time, he has campaigned, for instance, on the uh, trans, uh, transsexuals or LGBT rights or feminist um, he had a lot. Uh, he had a lot of propositions to to women that probably have been appealing to the youth. Mm. And, and you mentioned the question of purchasing power, which was a, a top priority for for French voters. I, I'm wondering, you know, go, going into the second round, uh, we're seeing kind of Emmanuel Macron uh, trying to be more present on on social issues, and uh, I, I'm wondering, um, out of the two candidates, uh, is um, how how uh, who will carry essentially the the social uh, the social issues uh, that were once defended by uh, you know uh, left wing parties that are not represented in in uh, in the second round? I, I guess another way of putting it is uh, yeah who uh, what is the room that will be given to to social uh, social policy in in, in the second round? Is that Yes, it is. It is one of the key issues, I think, uh, of the between the rounds uh, campaign. Uh, it has already been very important. Uh, we know from the polls that purchasing power is a top one priority, top one concern for the French. So it's very important. And Marine Le Pen's strategy has actually been not to campaign on so much on immigration. I mean, everything on immigration, she has already said, is still in her program, if you look at it but she did not emphasize it. And she did not need to really emphasize it because she had uh, Eric Zemmour in particular, but also Valérie Pécresse who emphasized immigration all the time. And I think uh, Marine Le Pen benefited from it without having herself to campaign on immigration. 
And um, because of that, she had room to campaign on purchasing power and social policy. Mm -hmm. um, and she tried to profile, her, to profile herself as social and to gain new voters among the most needy, um, uh, the most needy uh, voters. Um, probably it, is, it can be a topic in which she can try to appeal to the left voters. Um, this could be risky for Macron because if you have right-wing voters supporting Le Pen because of her cultural stances on immigration, etc., and left-wing voters refusing to support Macron because he has pursued a very neoliberal agenda five years uh, long, then uh, it could be difficult. So I think Macron's strategy indeed to emphasize Mm. environmental protection he has emphasized um, parts of his social policy also yesterday in the debate like right. the salary of the teachers or um, also the idea uh, to automatically give social aid without people having to to ask for them it, it would be a very important step and very social step um, he has emphasized such propositions i think in the uh, hope to convince left-wing voters to, to support him. I don't know how many people will be convinced because it's a very late move um, and it is quite at odds with the policy he has uh, implemented five years uh, long. Mm -hmm. uh, Vincent, I, I see you, uh, you were nodding a few times. Um, what are your thoughts about, about Yeah, um, uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron is not anymore a blank page. Which means that he 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 has um, he has done he, uh, a lot of things. He has made some move. He has made some change, and he's very happy with this kind of change. Uh, and that was uh, clear during the la last uh, last night debate uh, regarding, uh, for example, the unemployment reform, regarding his idea of a reti uh, pension reform, etc. Uh, etc. Et so it means that for um, for some of the leftist voters, uh, they they. They, they, they may be uh, forced to vote for uh, um, a president they have a fight in the street during five years. Yeah. And that's tricky. That's really tricky to vote for the republic and in the same time to vote in favor of the one who you, you have fight. Well, uh, the things are moving and you see that uh, finally uh, a lot of uh, Mélenchon voters are actually uh, moving toward um, a vote for the Republic, toward the uh, barrage Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same time, uh, what is really interesting is to see how uh, the French electorate see Emmanuel Macron now. It used to be the case when you were uh, asking them to place Macron on the left-right axis, uh, a large majority of them were putting it in the middle. He was a center. He was a center candidate. He was not on the left, but he was not on the right either. And so it explained why it was not so difficult for the left voters to vote for him um, in 2017. Uh, when you look at the data uh, done in December or uh, beginning, uh, beginning in March, you see that people are now placing in on the right. And actually, this is just a result of, uh, of his action during his first uh, mandate. This is also the result of his first move during the, uh, the presidential uh, campaign, where he actually appealed to the rightist voters. And it works. It works quite well when you see uh, at uh, the, 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 the drop in terms of voting intention for Val Valérie Pécresse and the rise for uh, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, and now he's in the middle of a, a paradox or a contradiction. He cannot be anymore both on the left and on the right. That was his proposal five years ago. And uh, this is why, actually, in Marseille, he made this move toward uh, uh, environment, and uh, he talked about uh, um, nominating a prime minister who will be responsible for ecological planning, etc., etc., because it was a possibility for him to to uh, set up the score and to move to another dimension of the cleavage. Mm -hmm. Trouble is that he has also um, he, he has also a, a bilan regarding uh, regarding environment and is not considered as a good one. So at the end, you 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 see that uh, he may be reelected and that will be probably uh, this is a, that will be an historical success. It has not okay. been done by a French president since Charles de Gaulle. And so it has to be kept in mind. But in the same times, you, 
you see that uh, he, he will be elected, but without a clear mandate, or at least without a mandate for a strong policy platform, which mm -hmm. is really interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Florence? Maybe I, I, I just want to, to add uh, something. Yes, I agree totally with, with uh, my colleagues because uh, uh, Macron has implemented some right-wing po policies, uh, right-wing policies. And I, I just want to add, he, he has also governed with two right-wing prime ministers. So it was also uh, the thing, so it's not a, it's obvious for, for French people because Edouard Philippe was coming from uh, Le, Les Républicains, the right-wing party, and Jean Castex was uh, very close to Sarkozy. So, so it's really uh, uh, clear for everybody that now he's, he's uh, taking the place of, of the, of the right-wing uh, parties and electorate. Mm -hmm. But I, I would add also to emphasize something else I think that the mobilization of the yellow vest beginning in 2018 and was real damage for him, a real, real wine. And because the, the mobilization uh, took him directly as a target and uh, uh, they, they, they were very anti-Macron and uh, they personalize uh, the things very much. And, and, it's, uh, and he appears for a large part of the population as an elitist president, because uh, uh, far away from the, the, the problem and the, and the difficulties of the poorest. And it was really, really a, a damage, uh, I think, on, this, on his image. And, and uh, the way the police repressed the demonstration give uh, him an image of uh, an authoritarian an authoritarian uh, leader and and it was uh, quite strong among uh, young people so just because I, I i have seen that in 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 in, uh, in the chat there is a question about macron and why finally why he, he, he is in bad position i think we cannot understand why he is in bad position without taking into account the, the yellow vest movement and the impact of, of the yellow vest uh, movement on, on uh, his image and also maybe it can raise another uh, issue it's the the issue of institution french institution because i, I think uh, macron um, was uh, uh, well take a, a, a very presidential turn. He personalized a lot uh, his, uh, his action. And finally, this is his problem. Because uh, I think, and this is not a, 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 a problem of, uh, of conjuncture. It's also a structural problem for French institution. And I think that after this uh, election presidential this this election sorry we will have to 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 do something uh, a reform uh, an institutional reform because it cannot work this way and i think we 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 have a, a good example of that so i want to get to a few questions uh, in a in a moment uh, keep them coming if you have any questions for our panelists feel free to ask them in in the uh, question and answer uh, box uh, I will uh, read uh, through them. Uh, one last question before uh, I open up uh, is, um, you know, I was reminded of 2002, uh, the last time that uh, a French president was re-elected was Jacques Chirac, uh, and he, there was this phenomenon um, uh, called the Barrage Républicain that Vincent, you, you spoke, uh, spoke about where the Democratic parties essentially cordoned uh, the far-right party, Jean-Marie Jean Le Pen and Jacques Chirac won the second round in, in 2000, uh, uh, 2002 and uh, 2007, sorry. No, 2002. And, uh, and Jacques Chirac was elected uh, with 82% uh, of the votes. Um, one thing is sure is that nothing, nothing like this will happen uh, on Sunday. I'm wondering uh, if you could briefly uh, tell me why if the barrage républicain, this very French concept, is a, is a thing of the past now? 
Vincent, you want to start? Yeah, I, 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 I want to just make it more complicated. Uh, first of all, um, you, you, you have to keep in mind that uh, on the long run, the uh, French society is less and less racist and more and more tolerant toward immigrants, toward diversity, toward multiculturalism. Uh, it is it is some kind of a paradox when you when you see Marine Le Pen uh, uh, qualifying for the second round twice in a row, which is uh, <laughs> which is also a, a novelty. Uh, but it has something to do with politicization. It has something to do with uh, uh, with the left um, leaving the li li leaving this kind of. Uh, question aside, uh, it has something to do with the left in, uh, being incapable of uh, talking uh, clearly about solidarity, about the question of, uh, uh, of social, um, social class, et cetera, et cetera. But when you think in terms of barrage républicain, you have to remind that uh, in 2002, 82% of the French electorate voted for Jacques Chirac. Uh, at, the, at, the, at, at the very night of the first round, you had demonstrations from the young uh, uh, and from the um, uh, upper, uh, high school uh, high, high school pupils against, uh, against Jean-Marie Le Pen. But this is the third time in uh, 20 years. This is, um, for, for uh, some leftist voters, it means that they are forced to vote between the less of two evils. And they, they, they have this impression of not being heard by their uh, uh, political representant, by their uh, political candidates. Uh, and it has also, and it cannot work anymore automatically. You can't ask people to vote for the Republic if you are not heard. And it, has, it tells also something about our incapacity of thinking about a, a new way of just counting the votes. You see that at least we, have a, we are on a tripolar system yeah. with the left, a center right right, and um, a, national, a nationalistic right. How can you still continue with this uh, um, way of counting votes, uh, where actually, which was designed for bringing two people uh, together two sides and fighting against each other on the second round. That does not work anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to make a choice, uh, you, if you want to make change, uh, institutionally speaking, yes, you have to think in terms of referenda. You have to think in terms of the place of citizens in the French uh, elect, um, institutional system. You have to think in terms of uh, proportional representation. You have to think in terms of why are parties not able to talk uh, between each other? Uh, and you, we will probably see that during the next legislative election. I'm not sure that the left will be able to uh, to, to, to have common candidate for the next, uh, next legislative election. I'm, quite sure that will be very tricky, complicated, and at the end, it will mean that this side of the political spectrum could not even be uh, represented in the National Assembly. So, so Vincent, this is uh, the perfect segue in, uh, into the, um, uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, we have one question by Olivier uh, about uh, the uh, election legislative, uh, which, is the, which are the elections uh, at um, the National Assembly. Uh, usually the legislative elections give the new elected president a majority to govern. Uh, do you think that there could be a surprise at the next legislative, opening a sequence of cohabitation? That's when uh, the head of the government and the head of state are of different parties. Um, opening a co co cohabitation, sorry, with a prime minister from Mélenchon or Le Pen's camps. Um, Florence, do you want to take that? Or Isabelle? Isabelle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isabelle? Okay. Um... Yes, it's true that since um, the legislative elections take place immediately after the presidential election, usually or always until until now, the new newly elected president has got a majority, uh, and it's the big question: what will happen? And in the end, it's very important because, from a constitutional point of view, the government is based on the parliamentary election, so. A uh, president without a majority will not be able to, he, he will have to concentrate on high politics and, and foreign policy, etc. And will have far much uh, less 
policy impact. So this would change everything. Um, so it will depend primarily the legislative elections uh, on the outcome of the presidential election. And if we depart, I think for Marine Le Pen, it would still, because of the logic of the Republican Front, which is not that strong um, as, um, as 20 years ago, but still works uh, in many cases, it will probably be difficult for Marine Le Pen to get a majority. Mm -hmm. If Macron is elected, it's also unclear because he's very much uh, hated in the, or he has, he's, yeah, he's not popular uh, at all. It could also be difficult for him uh, to get a majority, but what I would see coming, I would not see what majority, if you count the left votes, all the left votes, and if we assume that the left wing parties all ally at the legislative election, which is, as uh, Vincent has just emphasized, very unlikely, not to say impossible, if we look at the at the negotiation or the, the, the state of the discussion, we can discuss why it is like that. I will not enter into the details. Then still, it would be difficult to have a majority. So I would not, I would see less an alternative or uh, majority than um, the constraint for Macron to build uh, or for Le Pen. Um, it's difficult to to figure out, but mm -hmm. to build a majority in coalition with another party, and I think it may be possible because of what Florence has said to do that with the right uh, right wing uh, fraction. Florence, do you want to add anything on? Yes, the just to, to add something, Isabel uh, uh, reminded us that the government is based uh, on, on legislative election. I, I would like to add that the party funding also is based on, on, yes. on uh, uh, legislative uh, election. So that's why uh, legislative elections are quite important in the French political system, even though we have a big presidentialization, of course, well, never mind, uh, 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 legislative elections are, are also quite important. And um, I think, as, uh, as uh, Isabel and, uh, and Vincent said, they are very much more, more complex than <laughs> presidential election, much more complex to analyze, much more complex, complex to predict, because they, as you know, they depend on local situation and they depend on candidates on their local roots. They are also, uh, I think, uh, uh, complex because uh, in a different constituency, you will not have the same uh, 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 configuration of candidates. Right. Sometimes uh, we will uh, have uh, uh, three candidates, what we call a triangulaire. Uh, sometimes we will have four or five. So it's quite complex to, 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 to imagine what can uh, uh, go, uh, what can uh, go the, uh, from that. And also I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, 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 on a legislative election, the voting system is really very strongly disproportional. So we have a very a big difference between votes mm -hmm. and and uh, 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 the first one to come out get a very big advantage. And I want just to, to, to remind you that, for example, in 2017, Emmanuel Macron uh, won 32% uh, of the vote and he got 60% of the seats in the parliament. So that's yeah. why he, he can get a majority in that, you know, right. it's, it's really very disproportional. And I think that's why uh, maybe we are just uh, thinking about a way to, to, to get that uh, more proportional. <laughs> that's I, want to, uh, I want to get in uh, two, two other questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, maybe this is an opportunity for, uh, for Vincent. Uh, to clarify what you what you said earlier, um, Sashi is asking, uh, can you please clarify again the point made that the French electorate is less uh, racist, even in the face of the popularity of Le Pen? Uh, and yes. uh, but, sorry, there was a kind of a similar question uh, by Marie. Um, do you think that there's a bit of a denial about how deep um, about, sorry, about how deep and ingrained in French society some of the ideas of uh, Marine Le Pen and the far right uh, are. 
Well, uh, I, I know this is complicated, um, but when you look in the long run, for instance, uh, I, I mostly rely on the yearly barometer, which is uh, which is addressing question of racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, etc., etc. This is a yearly barometer done uh, with my colleague uh, uh, Gimishla, Nona Meyer, Tomaso Vitale, etc. And uh, we have it since the beginning of the 90s. And when you look at uh, how people, um, how people react when you ask them, uh, is there too many immigrants in France? Are the children of immigrants French like the other? Is uh, immigration the main source of insecurity? Are migrants coming in France only to benefit the social security, etc., etc.? Do they contribute to, to, the, to the economy, etc., etc.? So we have plenty of questions regarding uh, uh, racism, uh, xenophobia, etc., etc. And when you look at the long-term trend, you see that we are getting more and more tolerant on each of these dimensions. And, and you can understand why, because this is fueled both by the way uh, level of diploma is increasing in our society, just like in the US. You see also that there is a, a strong impact of generational renewal, meaning by that, this is the oldest generation who used to be the, the, the most uh, xenophobic and they are leaving the scene. Mm -hmm. Whereas a young generation are actually more and more uh, tolerant and particular be uh, particularly also because they are living in a very multicultural society. Last but not least, and this is, uh, and this is something of a very good news on this point. When you are getting older, you are also getting more tolerant because you are actually changing your attitude toward gender equality, toward uh, homosexuality, toward immigrant, and you are more tolerant today as you used to be uh, 10 years ago. So it means that we are going in the right way. But in the same time, when you look at the evolution of the National Front vote, what you see is that the National Front would have probably been a dominant party if people were voting uh, regarding their uh, attitudes toward uh, uh, migrant and uh, multiculturalism. It used to be uh, that people were not voting about these issues. They were voting about other issues, such as social redistribution, income inequalities, etc. Uh, the politics have changed in France, and now, with the National Front and with the Rassemblement National, uh, people are also voting, basing their vote on this kind of values. Which means that we are actually uh, seeing the people who are losing. They are, they are both uh, able to qualify for the second round. If the same voting trend was applying in the, in the 80s, it would have been a large majority in favor of Jean-Marie Le Pen. But because they have, their, their vote is not grounded in the same values, yes, okay, the National Front is getting votes. But that does not mean that it, it, it will be in the possibility to get 50% uh, of the vote. When you, uh, when you see the opinion poll for the, second, uh, for the second round, when you see that Marine Le Pen is almost as big as uh, Emmanuel Macron, Yes, but for, uh, don't forget that a lot of people say they will abstain, and these people who abstain disagree with uh, Marine Le Pen regarding issues of immigration, uh, multiculturalism, etc. Uh -huh. Interesting. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, one last question, sure. and then we'll close. Uh, and maybe this is for Isabel, since you've looked into the, the platforms uh, more precisely. A uh, question from Stefan. Uh, how strong a leadership role will Macron play in NATO? and how damaging would Le Pen uh, be? Oh, it's, uh, I'm not an expert on foreign policy, but uh, they are, they have, both the candidates have clarified their positions. Marine Le Pen has always been very mm. uh, skeptical as to any international commitment. She is very firm on national sovereignty. She has a bit, um, or she has put more nuance as to European integration, at least seemingly, it is, the, it is not addressed in her program. I think leaving the NATO is in her program, but, or at least she has taken explicitly uh, this position. I don't know if in the current situation she, is going to, she would be going to leave the NATO immediately. 
but at least it's more or it's it, it would be a source of large uncertainty if she would be uh, elected president and she would have a less at least a far less clear um, stance also towards Russia. She has, she had in her, um, or she has defended a more independent position in which France would be more independent. We know that she has borrowed money from a Russian bank. Uh, she claims that she is totally independent and it does not play a role, but still one can legitimately ask. Um, Macron, on the other hand, has been very, it is one of the subjects, there have been subjects on which he has changed, like immigration, he was much less uh, restrictive in 2017 than he has been during his term, um, but as, uh, as to international or uh, multilateralism, he has uh, remained very firmly engaged for, for it and also for European integration. And and sorry, and I, I will ask my real last question, uh, and a question, another question for the audience, and then I'll let everybody go. I think it's an interesting one, uh, Alison. Uh, is the situation in the U.S. with so many threats uh, to um, the more, and the question has disappeared? Um, sorry, is uh, essentially Alison was asking uh, if the situation uh, in in the U.S. with so many uh, threats uh, to democracy from the right. Uh, was influencing the way French voters see uh, see Marine Le Pen. Uh, I don't know who wants to take that question, Florence or Vincent. Well, well for me, the, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I don't think so that the, the well, um, I think that the, the, the campaign was really focused on Europe. Huh? Uh, and uh, they they didn't raise the issues about uh, the U.S. No, I don't think so, and I'm not sure that uh, uh, the 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 question of the threat on uh, U.S. democracy uh, has been important in in the uh, in the mind of the <laughs> the voters. Mm -hmm. I think that we are really used to 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 Marine Le Pen and to the Le Pen family since uh, uh, 40, 40 years. And uh, 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 we have a, a lot of people who are who are very aware of, of, of the danger of Le Pen, and uh, other people who, who, who are not and who are not looking at, at the United States uh, as an example. I think that uh, um, well, so I'm not sure it, it is important for for the election, but maybe my colleague have. A, other other answer uh, well i think that the the, the strategy of de demonization of Marine Le Pen was quite successful uh, for a lot of people who can say that uh, uh, and uh, well isabelle you can you can answer the question isabelle or vincent yeah isabelle? i think i think uh, it depends also on the voters um, there are a lot of voters who say Finally, we never have tried Le Pen, let's try and see, especially people who have nothing to lose. And on the other hand, there are many people who say, okay, well, we have perhaps not tried, but Orban, uh, Bolsonaro, Trump, <laughs> etc., have been tried. Uh, and we have seen what a very populistic conception of, of democracy brings about. Um, and I think that there is uh, the argument uh, but it's not seen, I think that argument is made especially by those already opposed uh, to Le Pen and his, uh, her supporters do not uh, particularly make this parallel. I think with Trump, I want, don't want to be too long, but I think we, you can also do a very strong parallel uh, with Zemmour, uh, who is very close in terms of profile. He also yeah. comes from the media. He's also very sexistic and... Um, and has a more provocative um, profile. And I think that you could make a lot of parallels with, um, with Trump. Mm -hmm. Vincent, do you want to close us off on that question? Oh, I, uh, I, I agree with my fellow colleagues. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, the, to, uh, the, the three of you for uh, sharing your perspectives and your thoughts uh, on, on where uh, the electorate stands. Uh, and we will, I guess we will see uh, what happens on, on Sunday evening in, in France. If you are a French person living in the US, uh, I just a reminder, we vote on Saturday and not Sunday. 
Uh, that's the difference with um, with the, the French people living in France who go on, on Sunday. Thank you to all of you and, um, and uh, we'll see what happens on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.